fashion. I can't think of an app example, again, and I still haven't yet heard one, uh, where customary international laws requiring the U.S. to act in a way that it, would, has, it is forcing the U.S. to act uh, in a way that it otherwise wouldn't have chosen to do. Again, the Alien Tort Claims, uh, Claims Act doesn't, doesn't do it. Laura? I can't really add to that because it's true. Congress can, and if we talk about sovereignty, Congress can choose to restrict the, the court's jurisdiction. Um, on whether it would hear any new common law crime, although also in that case of the recent one of Sosa, that it did itself say, the court said that we have this jurisdiction, but we're going to interpret this extremely narrowly. And the case before us does not, the arbitrary detention is not one of those examples where there is a common law crime that we should now introduce. But my, what my fellow panelists are saying is, we can always defy international law. Yeah, that's true, we can defy treaties. As a matter of fact, southern governors could defy federal law. And then it's a question of, will we send in troops? I, I thought the question was, is law being made for us by other people? And these examples are precisely laws being made for us by other people. There are all these customary norms in which we're being told, well, this is not a customary norm. It doesn't matter whether you agree, everyone else agrees. So that's good enough. Right. Excuse me, that's not good enough. Can you give me an example of where that's happened? Uh, I believe in a lot of the disputes about uh, law of war issues, people have been citing treaties that we are not parties to. And they say, starting with the International Committee of the Red Cross, well, everyone else has agreed to it, so it's like as if you agreed to it anyway, it's custom. And I'm sorry, that's not good enough. 99.9% uh, of the arguments, but, well, I think I should have the Lord, but <laughs> I've been looking at this pretty closely, and, and as far as I can tell, almost every argument that's made in that context are with regard to Geneva Conventions so that we, in fact, have ratified. No, a lot is based on, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I think you offered me an invitation earlier to also take a bite with your mentioned ICRC in the in your opening remarks, and then I hesitate because I realize they don't pay me anymore. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, that's why I'm here. I think. Go, go right ahead and bite. On the customary law issue, I mean, it's um, the ICRC. I'm surprised no one raised um, or brought it up, or with the last question that was asked, um, I'm surprised it wasn't brought up. The ICRC actually produced. Um, a three-volume set of its understanding of what is customary international humanitarian law. Now, that was done at the behest of states, just to let you know, and to be fair, because there are these international conferences that bring together all parties of the Geneva Conventions, which is every country in the world, as well as the national societies from around the world, and they pass, obviously, non-binding things, but by consensus, they thought, oh, it would be kind of good to know, to have some research done into what are some of these customary rules that apply during our conflict. So that's what started it, and the ICRC did that. And the U.S. has taken issue with certain methodologies of how ICRC has um, done the studies with some of the rules, which it is fair to do. It's, this is not a binding document. This is just a reflection of trying to look at state practice and appear in U.S. and coming up with a perspective of what the customary rules are. It's obviously inappropriate to tell a state that's not party to a treaty that it's bound by its rules if there's not some basis in customary international law. It was asked earlier, well, what do we do? How do we handle these different interpretations? It's sort of the bottom line, then, and treaties have different interpretations that they aren't worth anything, and I think try to make the case that there are some practical needs for treaties. But even in the law of war treaties, that you know, some of those date back to the late 1800s. My role as legal advisor, since there aren't formal mechanisms um, with international humanitarian law, well, there are some courts, but not on some of the day-to-day -day interpretations, is to discuss with the state authorities. And it was a, a healthy give and take. This is our understanding of what the law means, and that's your understanding of what the law means. And you don't do it because you don't out uh, of a legal obligation, but you're going to do this and this action because of a policy decision. Great. That still may lead to the same outcome, at least for an organization like the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, on your comments earlier in your, in your opening statement, um, I wasn't sure if your concern was a, an organization like ICRC being involved and being out there, or that the U.S. would actually care to want to bother to cite that it's doing things in cooperation with the ICRC. 
It's a private organization. It has no more authority than the Federalist Society. I think it has less authority than the Federalist Society <laughs> when it comes to American law, because the Federalist Society is at least an American organization. So the concern is really that the United States government thinks it's worthwhile to cite to the ICRC, and we should not, or to say that it's working with the ICRC. I think they are treating it as if it is quasi-authoritative, which is, of course, a role that the ICRC is only too happy to play. It's not exactly in charge, but it's sort of counselor to humanity. And I, there's no such category. But I mean, I think it's interesting because I think there are, you know, it's, I think the U.S. does want to cite sometimes that it's working with the ICRC because the values it espouses, that espouses that we are in compliance with our treaties, that we do not do certain behavior, we do engage in other certain behavior. Weak-minded politicians do many unfortunate things, right? And they try to they try to bolster their position however they can with whatever is at hand. And they give away sovereign powers, as in Europe, or they sign treaties which they shouldn't, or they enact statutes which they shouldn't. But at the end of the day, you cannot say, well, this is no infringement on sovereignty because somebody agreed to it. I mean, there are certain limits of what we could agree to. I do not think it can be uh, constitutional to have a statute which says, uh, whatever the Secretary General of the UN says, that will be binding on us. It could be enacted by Congress, that's not a legitimate statute. And similarly, it's not a legitimate way to make customary law to say, some people in Switzerland did a study and now that is customary international law. It's ridiculous. All right. <laughs> We're over time. There have been two gentlemen who have been waiting very patiently there, so I'd ask you to keep your questions very sharp and our responses brief, and then we can uh, stay more or less uh, on schedule. Sir, a very short question on a topic that I think we're all very concerned about, and that is the increasing attempts of foreign governments or NGOs to hold or attempt to uh, accuse or hold accountable our troops in war or our politicians for war crimes. Uh, the question I have for the panel is, that, is this really happening? How big of a problem is it? Is there anything we can do to stop it? Yeah. I mean, I think there are two different questions there. The states holding U.S. troops accountable, we could talk, we don't have time here, but the whole issue of um, the International Criminal Court and, and, and universal jurisdiction that occurs under certain law of war treaties. Um, but also with the idea of um, NGOs holding individuals, we can't really hold anybody accountable per se. Um, and I don't mean to stand up here and say that everything that NGOs do is great, but isn't that what also is important in, in a democracy where there's rule of law, that NGOs and civil society has actually a greater say and then can bring about change? Um, I know one of the criticisms in general for international human rights treaties, and Professor Hathaway has written on this, so I should really turn to her, is that you know there's no great costs for dictatorships to sign on to these treaties. It makes them look good in the international community. And then at home, there aren't these mechanisms that really ensure that the government itself will live up to its obligations. But here in democracy, we have civil society that does speak out and NGOs. Um, and so I think we need to balance, you know, yes, what the roles are that should be respected, but I think there is a key role here for the I just want to uh, affirm the premise of the question that this is something that should be a great concern because it's it's any country that wants to set itself up as a judge of Americans, not because of something that they've done in that country or even against that country, but just against that country's view of the laws of humanity. That is an outrageous infringement on our sovereignty. And again, I think this is happening because weak-minded politicians haven't protested. It's the president's duty to say, if you try an American in this context, uh, that would be a, such an affront to the United States that uh, we will feel authorized to respond if necessary by force to stop you. That is called defending the United States and its armed forces, and it is the duty of the commander in chief. Are you, are you proposing that we, we authorize military force on uh, the Hague? We have done that already by statute, and my former Senator Hillary Clinton voted for it, and she was right to do so. Because people in New York State, they speak as a former New Yorker, were outraged at the idea that. Uh, the International Criminal Court could hold Americans accountable for defending the United States. And if we don't trust the uh, hate tribunal to do it, why would we trust some court in Spain or some or Belgium or some other country which just said, I'd like to act for humanity because Spain is too small. We extradite them. <laughs> we extradite them when they've committed a crime in that country. But these were proposing to say, on behalf of humanity, we're going to prosecute you for what you did in Iraq. Iraq is not objecting, but we object on behalf of Iraq that Saddam Hussein is near anymore to bring the case. This is preposterous. It's really preposterous and outrageous. And, and, and it's a real, real symptom of how we've been sliding into the idea that 
you know, there is a global community, and the global community has global norms, and anyone can act on behalf of global norms, which means you're completely abstracted from the fact that it actually is a world of sovereign states that need to defend themselves. So the last question. Yes, to short for the question about NGOs, I don't think anyone disagrees that uh, the ICRC can, like any NGO, talk. Uh, the question is, uh, and I direct this to uh, Ms. Olson, uh, does it have some authoritative 